Welcome students to the final installment in my series of conceptual lectures on chemical equilibrium. Continuing on from what we discussed in our last lecture to which I'll link right here, we'll now move on to another subject. I want you to imagine that we have an equilibrium reaction. Now with that reaction, let's suppose that we do know the concentration of the reactants and the products at some moment in time, but we have no idea whether or not those concentrations are at equilibrium. How in the world can we figure out if this particular reaction at this moment in time is at equilibrium? Well, the way we do this is by calculating QC, which is called the reaction quotient. QC is pretty much exactly the same as KC, except that QC may or may not derive from concentrations that are at equilibrium. Let me explain. For any general reaction like this, QC, the reaction quotient, is equal to this. Now you should note that QC looks exactly the same as KC, except that these concentrations, C, D, A, and B, might or might not be at equilibrium. Hopefully that makes sense. So conceptually, let's see what that means. Or in other words, let's ask the question, why in the world would we care about calculating QC? Well, here's why. First, if QC equals KC, then your reaction is at equilibrium. But what if QC is greater than KC? Well, if that's the case, then your reaction is obviously not at equilibrium, and the concentration of the products is too large. Now, if the concentration of the products is too large, see there in the numerator, then the reaction has to shift to the left toward reactants before it can reach equilibrium. But what if QC is smaller than KC? Well, if that's the case, then your reaction is also not at equilibrium, obviously. But in that case, the concentration of the reactants in the denominator is too big. In this circumstance, the reaction has to shift to the right toward products before it can reach equilibrium. Hopefully that makes sense. So the point is, if we know QC and we know KC, then we can predict which direction a particular reaction has to move or shift in order to reach equilibrium. Oh, and you can also do the same thing using QP and KP. That takes us to a wonderful problem. At 100 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium constant for this reaction right here has a value KC equals this crazy number here. Is the following mixture of these different ingredients at equilibrium? And then it gives us the individual concentrations of those three ingredients. If not, in what direction does it need to shift to achieve equilibrium? Now, I'm not going to do this for you, but we'll let you do it on your own. Nevertheless, I will give you some counsel. Using the instructions I just outlined, determine the QC expression and then throw in each of these values for each of these ingredients. Once you do that, you should then determine if your QC in this circumstance is greater than, equal to, or smaller than KC, which is given in the problem. Once you know that, you should be able to determine whether or not this reaction is at equilibrium, and if not, which direction it needs to shift in order to reach equilibrium. Let's take a look at another problem. At 400 kelvins, the equilibrium constant for this reaction here is Kp equals 7. Now that's an equilibrium constant with respect to pressure. A closed vessel at 400 K is charged with one atmosphere of bromine, one atmosphere of chlorine, and two atmospheres of bromine chloride. Use Q to determine which of the following statements here is true. Now I'm not going to give you the answer to this right away, but we'll invite you to attempt to do it on your own. If you wish, however, you can click this link to a separate video in which I do it for you on the board. I now want to turn to a different subject, that of Le Chatelier's principle. Now Le Chatelier's principle states this. Quote, if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, it will shift in whichever direction it has to to restore equilibrium. Now you might ask, what do you mean by the word disturbed? Well, systems at equilibrium can be affected or disturbed in four different ways. First, by changing the reactant or product concentrations. Second, by changing the volume or pressure. Third, by changing temperature. And fourth, by adding a catalyst. We're now going to examine how each of these different things disturbs a reaction at equilibrium and how Le Chatelier's principle allows that reaction to then compensate or respond to that disturbance. First, we'll begin by looking at changes in concentration. So I want you to imagine that we had this reaction sitting at perfect equilibrium. Now, because the reaction rate going forward and backward are the same, at equilibrium, the reaction, we could say, is balanced. 
kind of like a scale. I've got a cute little picture of a scale, all nice and balanced. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what the scale is saying. Remember what I said in an earlier video. When a reaction is at equilibrium, that does not necessarily mean that the amounts of reactants and products are the same. So this figure might actually make you think that the amounts are the same. That is not necessarily the case. It just means that the rate of going from left to right is the same as the rate going from right to left. You good? Okay. The reason I'm showing you this on a scale, however, is to use it as a teaching tool to help you sort of visually see what Le Chatelier's principle actually does. So I want you to ask yourself the question, what would happen if we removed C? Well, the scale would, of course, tip to the left, like this. So that begs the question, how then could you get the reaction back into balance? Well, the way you do that is by making more C. In other words, A and B could convert over to form more C and D and in turn decrease the amounts of A and B until you restored balance. This is exactly what happens when concentrations or amounts of reactants or products are disturbed or changed in an equilibrium setting. This is Le Chatelier's principle applied specifically to change in concentration. We can say then that when concentrations are disturbed or changed, the components will drift in whichever direction left or right is needed in order to restore balance. Let's turn then to an example problem. I want you to consider the equilibrium shown here between N2O4 and NO2. And I want you to answer each of the following questions. In which direction will the equilibrium shift if N2O4 is added? If NO2 is removed? If N2O4 is removed? And if NO2 is added? If you wish, you can pause the video here and think about this. And I hope that you do and see if you can figure it out. You can then hit play in which I will explain the answers to each of these. Let's naturally begin with the first example, A. If I add N2O4, what happens? Well, I have a lot of N2O4 here. In other words, the left side is heavy. I need to restore balance by removing N2O4 and forming NO2. So what will occur? Well, the equilibrium will shift to the right, removing N2O4 by converting it to NO2. Now we'll look at part B. What occurs if NO2 is removed? Well, now I have a gaping hole on the right side of the equation. In which direction will this equilibrium shift in that circumstance? It, of course, has to fill in that hole by shifting also to the right, converting N2O4 into NO2. That will decrease the amount of N2O4 and restore the amount of NO2 until it restores balance. What happens if I remove N2O4? Well, now I have a gaping hole on the left side of the equation. In order to restore that N2O4 that has now been lost, NO2 has to convert into N2O4. So my equilibrium in that circumstance is going to shift to the left. And what happens if NO2 is added? Well, now I have a lopsided amount on the right side of the equation. How do we restore balance there? We have to get rid of the excess NO2 and produce some N2O4. So in this circumstance, the equilibrium is also going to shift to the left. Did each of those circumstances make sense to you? If so, great. If not, then I counsel you to devise your own equilibrium scenarios and try to imagine what would occur if you added or took away components from either the left or the right side of the equation. With this solid in your minds, hopefully, let's see how Le Chatelier's principle applies to settings in which we change volume or pressures. To do this, I want you to remember that when pressure is increased, equilibrium reactions will shift in whichever direction reduces the number of gas molecules. Why? Well, I like to imagine a system being like a crowded room where the number of moles of gas molecules, or N, is kind of like the number of people in the room. Now, if we increase N, the number of people in the room, does the pressure that the people are feeling go up or down? Well, of course, it's going to go up. Everyone feels more crowded. So how do you relieve that pressure? Well, you do it by removing people or gas molecules. To do that, you have to shift your reaction in whichever direction gives you fewer gas molecules. This, of course, can be seen by looking at the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. If N, the number of moles or people in the room, using this metaphor, goes up, then pressure goes up. And that makes sense. You'd feel a lot more crowded and a lot more pressure of one molecule to the other if you were a person in a room or a gas molecule in a container. 
An equilibrium reaction wants P to go back down to where it was before. How is this accomplished? By decreasing N, the number of gas molecules, by shifting the reaction to whichever side has fewer moles of gas. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, what if P goes down? In other words, I decrease the pressure that the gas molecules are feeling inside the room or container. Well, in that scenario, the equilibrium reaction is going to adjust in whatever way increases P. And that will happen by increasing the number of people in the room or shifting the reaction in whichever direction has more gas molecules. Now, what about V, the volume or size of the room or container? What if that goes up? Well, if V goes up, you can imagine if you're a person in a crowded room, if suddenly the volume or size of the room increased, now what's happened is the pressure has decreased because you have the same number of people in the room, but you have a lot more room. So the amount of pressure that you're feeling pushing against each other is going to be way smaller. Now, if you're in an equilibrium setting, please keep in mind that the reaction wants to adjust to restore balance. That is, it wants to get the pressure to go back to where it was. If you increase the volume of the room, you decrease the pressure. So which direction is it going to shift? Well, of course, the equilibrium reaction is going to shift in whichever direction is going to increase pressure. And it can do that best by increasing the number of gas molecules. So it will shift in whichever direction increases the total moles of gas. Now, what happens if V goes down? Imagine you're in the room and all of a sudden the room becomes smaller. The volume of the container becomes smaller. Well, what happens is pressure goes up. So naturally, you're going to want to compensate by decreasing pressure, removing people from the room. How do you do that? By shifting the reaction in whichever direction decreases the number of gas moles. You can see that interrelation between pressure, volume, and gas moles expressed in the ideal gas law shown up here. Let's take a look at an example then. Consider this equilibrium, N204, in equilibrium with two moles of NO2, both of them being gas. In which direction will equilibrium shift in each of these given scenarios. I invite you to pause the video right here and attempt to think through these and answer them on your own. You can then hit play while I describe the answer for you. In the first scenario, I've added N2. That is a gas. Now, I realize that if you use the crowded room analogy that I've been using before, that is, if you compare gas molecules inside a container to people inside a crowded room, then logically adding N2, despite it not being a reactant or product in this equilibrium system, would increase the pressure of the overall room or system and thereby cause a shift in whichever direction has fewer gas moles in order to alleviate that pressure. However, this is one limitation of that analogy. In reality, as it turns out, if you add a gas to a system where that gas is not one of the reactants or products in the system, you actually get no shift whatsoever. Again, that is a limitation of that analogy. Now, in scenario B, what happens if the volume is increased? You increase the volume, you've now decreased the pressure. In an equilibrium scenario, you want to get back to how things were. So you want to increase the pressure. How do you do that? By increasing the number of people in the room. So you're going to shift in whichever direction increases the total number of moles of gas. I've got one mole of gas on the left, two moles of gas on the right. So which direction will I shift in scenario B? Yeah, you guessed it. I'll shift to the right. I hope this makes sense. I'll let you tackle options C and D on your own.